So another batch of Great Dark Beyond cards has been officially fully revealed, and we're going to review them, talk about them in great detail, and then give them all-star ratings. Kicking it off here with the Exodar, an 8-mana 610 Legendary. With a battle cry, if you're building a starship, launch it and choose a protocol. So I'm not going to do the full starship spiel since that was in yesterday's video, but quick recap, you assemble starship pieces throughout a game. Normally you spend five mana to launch your starship, which then summons the minion with the combined stats and effect of all those starship pieces. Instead, you can use the Exodar to launch your starship. Uh, you don't have to spend the five mana. Then of course you're spending eight on this card, which is kind of making this look like a three mana 610, which is actually pretty insane to start. And then you also get these three potentially crazy upsides, the protocols as they're called. Emergency repairs will gain armor equal to the starship's health twice. I think that's very easily, by the time you get to turn eight, if you're stacking your deck with starship pieces, you're talking about like 10, 15 health minions. That means like 30 armor gained possible here. I mean, it could be even more of course, but I think like reasonably 30 armor gained off the emergency repairs. That's kind of nuts if you're playing defensively. Offensive formation, deal damage equal to the starship's attack randomly split between all enemies. That is again, potentially like really big. It's not getting doubled, but I think still 15 damage, not unreasonable, making this look a bit like, you know, an Astalor, uh, maybe a bit like a Sire Denathrius, you know, the potential to just completely blow up a board or the enemy's face. Also keep in mind, you know, it's not just like an 8-8 Astalor that's, you know, doing this crazy, you know, lethal push sort of thing or board clear sort of thing. You're also getting a 610 and you're getting the starship. So if it's dealing 15 damage, it means you're getting a 15 damage starship. So it's gonna be this incredibly swingy turn where you wipe the board, chip some health face damage off potentially, and summon two big old bodies because you get the 610 Exodar and your starship on board all at once. That's gonna be this like big push to make a game winning line. And I think it often will be actually. And then also crew transport. This one allows you to get copies of all the starships pieces and set their costs to one. So if you don't feel confident that either of these will end a game, like if the armor gain is not gonna shut down an aggro deck, if the damage is not gonna like present lethal or swing the board or do enough, you know, you're playing somebody else who has 30 armor from their from their Exodar, uh, you can go for value instead and crew transport will allow you to get a ton of value. You're still gonna get this like big board presence, big swing, you're still gonna get the big starship, but then you get to start over, right? You get to play new starship pieces, start developing a new starship and then launch it normally uh, for five cost later. So, you know, you could just make another big push on board with the initial minions. Like, hey, I'm gonna just dump a bunch of stuff on you the turn after you clear this big board. And then after that, I'm gonna summon another starship. So it's kind of like three turns, potentially of monster threats and, and boards that might be really hard to answer. So I, I think depending on the matchup, on the game state, all three of these provide really efficient output that they do things that you love. I think XLR itself has a great stat line. You know, you're kind of saving five mana when you play this. So that three mana 610 is what this looks like. That's awesome. The starship itself. I already was pretty sold on, on starship potential. So yeah, I, I actually think this card looks really good and not only supports starships, which I thought were already solid, but then this really gives you a reason to go for starships because these are win conditions. And as soon as you find that XLR, uh, you might be winning some games. So I think this card looks really good. So moving on to more neutral cards. This is one of the two like neutral card reveal days. We're going to take a look at some epics, including Star Volpira, which is a Star Fox, if you will. This is a five mana four five tradable battle cry. Destroy an enemy starship or starship piece, which uh, this becomes, you know, the tech card answer of sorts. We had that like, uh, what was it, like? demolition renovator or something that destroyed locations right when we got locations this is that same sort of idea same sort of cost now i will say destroying a star starship is going to be far more significant than destroying a location so i do think this has a lot more swing potential we, we saw how quickly and how easy it was to get like you know a 6-6 six, six divine shield starship in yesterday's review and there's going to be much bigger starships than that this thing's clearly going to be dealing with like you know 10 10 divine shield taunt minions with some kind of other silly bonuses which does make it really swingy and this might be one of those that does ebb and flow a little bit you know as as kind of like starships come in and out of fashion and decks that use starships come in and out of fashion 
I suspect early in an expansion cycle, this is going to be everywhere because starships are going to be really popular. Then, you know, the metal will sort of settle and there, there might be like two or three decks that, that reliably use starships and there'll be some other aggro decks or other packages that don't need a starship. And then Star Volpira might kind of drop in use. This might be something you see in a lot of decks, but then you find it's only like control decks that just need removal tools or, you know, have room to kind of run a tradable card like this that doesn't disrupt their own synergistic game plan decks that are playing a bit more reactively probably can find room for Star Volpira. I, so I do think this is good. I do think it's potential, but I do also think it's a card that will fall off over time pretty notably. So it'll have a fairly short lifespan of significant relevance and then still, you know, linger around here and there for a little while as metas demand. So a, a good outlet of sorts that starships don't completely dominate everything. And and I know there might be an argument like, oh, doesn't this kind of ruin starships? Like, oh, everybody's going to run this. Starships won't be any fun. I don't think so. This is still a very expensive card, uh, you know, very situational card, a very narrow card. So I don't think it'll feel too bad. Tradable definitely helps relieve a little bit of that narrowness pressure, but I, I still think it's fine. And it, it, if it became a problem and starships weren't fun, I don't think they would print this, right? They want the new exciting thing to be good. If this was coming in and just ruining that, I don't think this card would exist or it would just cost more or something. So I think it will be in a healthy spot. So relevant, just not uh, busted for long. Moving on to the Red Giant. Uh, that's funny. We got <laughs> Red Giant stars, but they're also giants in Hearthstone. It's an 8-man 8 8-8, 8, of course. Elemental costs one less for each adjacent card played while in hand. Um, so this is kind of cool. We've got a few cards already dealing with like sort of managing your hand area. We had the, the Demon Hunter Legendary with the stars colliding, and now this one as well. I do think this is a challenging condition to meet, though. Because it, it's just really hard to predict where things are going to be at the right times. You know, like, I, you know, it's turn two. I need to play a two cost card. My two cost card is nowhere near my red giant. It's turn three. My three cost card is nowhere near my red giant and so on. Like, it's just going to take a long time. Now, there are, of course, maybe decks that go for some kind of crazy empty hand like the Demon Hunter we talked about. And you just like burn through cards so fast that you're you're just down to the red giant. But even then, if you're playing them from the wrong side, it's like you're not going to get enough new cards to start discounting this fast enough. You want to play four or five things next to, this, next to this to get it into that playable state. Probably ideally, you want to kind of play eight things next to this to make it really good. And I don't know how easy that's going to be, even with things like drinks uh, that do kind of like go off multiple times in a row and stuff, you know, and, and you can chain together some, some, some combos like that. I still think it's going to be hard to get it down fast enough, not to mention there's a deck construction problem where you need to make sure you know, everything's cheap enough um, and flexible enough. Like, you you know, your plays have to work it kind of um, in a board agnostic way. Like, you, you don't want to have, like, a ton of reactive stuff because you may not have the things to react to, right? So you have to have a more proactive deck with minions that are flexible to play on curved. You can't have things go in certain orders. And you just create all these conditions on the Red Giant where I think it's going to get awkward and stuck in hand. Maybe there's a world where a deck is actually playing this kind of later and playing for some kind of big swing turn where you just, like, wait and wait and wait and you play Red Giants and a Lotheb style effect that locks out the opponent and you know you're just using these as like an eventual zero cost 8-8 but I wonder if there aren't just always better tools for that already we've seen so many things uh that do that similar sort of thing but maybe more reliably so I think to me this card is going to be awkward although I will acknowledge this is one that sometimes you have to see these sorts of things in action to know how easy it feels to achieve my instincts tell me though it's not going to be that easy Moving on here to the Ace Wayfinder, a 5-mana five 5-5 five five Draenei. Battlecry gained two random bonus effects. The bonus effects are, of course, just the base keywords like Taunt, Rush, Lifesteal, Divine Shield, all that stuff. Uh, the next Draenei you play gains them as well. And, um, you know, you can imagine scenarios where this hits, like, really nice. Like, you get Rush and Divine Shield, and you're like, oh my god, yeah, this thing was great. And my next Draenei is going to have it as well. That's great. And I'm so excited. But you could also imagine so many scenarios where you spent 5 mana and you got absolute garbage you got keywords that just don't matter and the, the 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 effects and cards we've seen use this bonus effects thing successfully in the past it's like you know mage summoning seven four fives and it's like okay well yeah two of them sucked but three of them were great so it didn't matter because i had enough bonus effect checks here to make sure i was going to hit some great rush divine shield and stuff that i cared about with only two rolls on the ace wayfinder and then actually those two rolls getting duplicated you might be kind of doubling down on badness and that unreliability i think is going to make this card really difficult to play even even with those high rolls it's just not going to be worth it that is a big mana commitment moving on to the doom maiden a four mana four four demon uh battle cry draw a card from your opponent's deck if you don't play it this turn put it back 
which uh potential deck disruption here i think the problem on this is just a uh, cost number one like if you play this on turn four well not really doing anything you're getting a look at a card from your opponent's deck right that's about all uh so you're not going to want to play this on four so you're going to want to wait till later so that you can hopefully play the thing that you get but the odds of hitting one that's played like so you play this on turn seven like you're going to get a three or less cost card yeah okay you stole a single three or less cost card is that good are you going to want to play that three cost card not all the time no it's going to be some synergy thing you don't care about and you're never going to be able to steal something gigantic and steal like their best awesome most amazing cards i mean you might occasionally hit something that's like you know zero mana resca or something but ultimately it's it's very often going to feel like you just you know can't steal the things you want or you just literally can't steal them at all because the cost is too high and you've waited forever to play this because you're trying to get to 10 mana to steal a six cost card and you still don't hit it so inconsistency a real challenge to make an actual impact at all this is very often just a four mana four four and that is certainly not very good Moving on here to the Mutating Life Form. This is a five mana, three, eight amalgam. It is horrifying looking, this poor Draenei. After this survives damage, gain a random bonus effect. So once again, we see the bonus effects here and uh, you know, you potentially more rolls, but also potentially no rolls. Like this may just not survive damage. That feels like, a, a, a again, a really big expensive risk. I will acknowledge that because, you know, this is an amalgam, there's always little weirdness that can happen. And, you know, even Draenei, like, you know, you, you could kind of invest some past Draenei to play some effect that buffs this one and makes it better. We're going to see a card here uh, shortly. I don't know where it is, but it's going to give like two, plus two health and rush to the next Draenei you play. And, you know, this is suddenly a 310 with rush. And you're like, well, okay, that's kind of intriguing I'm, I'm a little like i'm keeping the door open on this one compared to that like last five cost ran i that seems really really hard to play to me this is like it's it's an amalgam so it might find some little nook somewhere where some Draenei beast deck comes together or maybe it's not Draenei at all you know maybe it's demons and maybe it's beasts and, and maybe it's pirates i don't know there's some world but ultimately i will say the effect on this just doesn't seem that strong I'm just a little bit intrigued by the health and the kind of flexibility of the amalgam status. So I'm not writing it off, but I also don't really have a lot of hope for this one. I don't love it. Just keeping that door open. So next up here is the Splitting Space Rock. And my God, there is a lot going on in this card. It's an eight mana, eight, eight elemental death battle summon two, four, four splitting boulders. Those summon two, two, two splitting stones. Those summon two, uh, one, one pebbles. And of course the pebbles are done. It would really be funny if the pebbles had summoned two zero zero peblets or something, you know, baby pebbles, and they just died. <laughs> That'd be really funny. But anyway, I guess you get what, like seven bodies in this card, which is kind of crazy. The ultimate token generator, you know, ultimate corpse generator. Uh, that's all pretty cool. I, I think the real challenge of course, is that this costs eight mana and the impact of each individual stage is pretty limited by the time you get to a regular, like, you know, eight mana game state scenario. It doesn't have any immediacy, it doesn't have any taunt, you know. There are decks that, of course, can benefit from all these bodies and tokens, and theoretically, you know, maybe some elemental stuff pops in, but I think it's just too hard to get all that going uh, around turn eight, and it's gonna be hard to pay this off, you know. Corpse package, Death Knight doesn't need this, they're making so many corpses so much faster. They're trying to use those corpses to end the game, not just play another splitting space rock. So probably an insane arena card, I'm sure, but just not a great constructed card. So moving on to the perplexing anomaly, or as I like to call it, the raging anomaly, because this is definitely a rager. It's a three mana two five with rush taunt and stealth. <laughs> of course it's saying, hey, why does this need stealth? It really doesn't, that's what makes it perplexing, but maybe there's something interesting here with the stealth angle. I don't know, that that like, the, the fact that it's so on the nose and so called out like makes me intrigued. Is there some reason you would wanna give an elemental stealth? Can you like buff it and give it wind fury and shaman's gonna like find a way to make this card decent? I don't think so, that seems fairly unlikely, but at the same time, it is in the back of your mind. Like this has some hooks. This has something that could be plugged into and could be an upside, so. I don't think under normal circumstances this card gets played at all, but there might be that tiny little chance, that perplexing element here that keeps <laughs> keeps it in mind and it could show up somewhere down the road, but very unlikely. Moving on to the Stranded Spaceman. This is what I was teasing earlier. The two mana, two, three Draenei battle cry. The next Draenei you play gains plus two health and rush, which 
is actually pretty good like that's not bad you know you just get a little little body down here just trade in a little bit and set up for that next play i think the question is like will any given deck have an on curve play that they're happy about with that you know you're gonna have a natural three cost fit or this feels like it's a good reason to do that that's gonna help this a lot and then is it good enough with uh velen we saw velen the big seven cost ran i payoff giving that rush is actually really valuable because it had that death rattle effect and if you just plop it down sometimes it is susceptible to being removed to silence well removed but you know what i mean like poofed basically uh to silence those sort of effects can happen to, to velen so giving it rush could be a way to circumvent that for decks that don't have some way to instantly activate it or kill it or cheat it out or whatever to avoid some of those problems so maybe there's some world where you you're playing your stranded spacemans on six and then you you know you're playing a velen on seven that said it's gonna have nine health so not the easiest thing to still trade in right like there's not a lot of instances where your opponent's gonna have a nine attack card on board which honestly might be part of the reason this has plus health to avoid those sort of scenarios so like some potential there some potential just you know as a natural just like i need enough draenei and my draenei deck and like you know this is going to be a little buffed up because i played the turn one draenei and then you just kind of curve out your draenei all with these little bonuses that start to increment into the mid game and you know before you know it you're ahead because you're just realizing all this draenei consistency this does feel like it could do that because you get both reactivity and you get some actual raw stats both which seem important so I think this is a solid little Draenei building block. Nothing crazy here, not fundamental, but a, a deck that's relying on multiple Draenei bodies and consistency probably takes a look at this one. Next up is the Moonstone Mauler, a two mana two, two elemental. Battle cry, shuffle three asteroids into your deck that deal two damage to a random enemy when drawn. So uh, a little tiny elemental body here with this asteroid upside. Uh, the way this reads, I'm pretty sure we're going to get Asteroids showing up somewhere else because this reads a lot like the Sludge card. We got that like one neutral Sludge card and then we're like, what the heck? Why is this getting a weird like uh, little token all by itself? And then Sludge showed up in Warlock. This is the same kind of thing. You're getting an Asteroid in the neutral set. Maybe Asteroids show up in like Shaman or whatever with some Elementals. And then, uh, you know, you go from there. So this is like looks like a neutral card but maybe this is really like kind of a shaman card or whatever where asteroids are a little deck package which does you know increase the thought on this because i certainly wouldn't think this is enough all on its own you know like two of these even you know you only got six asteroids that's 12 damage kind of randomly hitting minions and occasionally face this is one where you definitely want to make sure you hit that critical mass and then then you're paying off any kind of card draw effects that are finding all these asteroids if you're improving the power of them or whatever there are suddenly ways you could do that we've also got like incendius from the last set as well so you could build a little deck that's just like blow everything up with all of these cards in decks and stuff and i think that actually sounds pretty cool and uh pretty fun it's it's hard to get a read on on power level on this yet but it seems okay you know like if you're committing to that six damage on a two drop is pretty good so it seems it seems solid enough so next up here is the Troubled Mechanic, a two mana, two one Draenei with Divine Shield and Spell Burst, draw a Draenei. So number one, this is a solid little body, you know, on its own, eh, it's fine. And then you've got, you know, various, we've already seen stat buffs for Draenei. There's already gonna be a way to give this uh, some extra attack. It's gonna gain like maybe health and rush, for instance, we just talked about. So uh, Divine Shield starts to magnify some of the other Draenei upsides that we've seen, which feels good. The question for this is really that spell burst for me. Um, number one, like if you play this on two, can you reliably activate it later? Like, do you still, are you able to tempo this out on curve and feel good about it? Maybe, I think some matchups, it probably survives thanks to that divine shield, that stickiness helps. And then, you know, you weave it in in other scenarios on turn five or six or whatever. It's just kind of a cheap way to keep fighting new Draenei. The question though becomes like spell burst. What kind of decks exist and, and how are they melding spells and Draenei together? What are the cost of those spells? what are the uh, sort of flexibility of playing those spells in certain moments in other words does this ever get kind of awkward and stuck in hand because you're waiting to realize that spell burst we do see of course most decks these days have a nice balance it's not that hard to do a spell burst but we have seen scenarios you know like hand buff paladin where spells are actually rather limited something like this would be kind of clunky and if you're leaning into a draenei package that's really heavy on minions and you want to keep paying off the Draenei chain of supporting the next Draenei, maybe you do go a little light on spells. In other words, I, I could see decks and scenarios where this does get left out. Like it's just not that rewarding of an effect. 
and maybe it doesn't make the cut but i do think it's doing enough like it's got divine shield as that upside it's got spell burst so maybe it's still fine just not a not again a, a home run the, these kind of little neutral draenei you, you see glimpses of potential but you're sure there are decks that won't really need them and can cut them so they just look okay Moving on to the Brain Gill. This is a two mana two one Murloc with Battle Cry. Give all friendly Murlocs Death Rattle, draw a card, which um, that's potentially a really, really good sort of effect. I remember that token druid list ran that spell that did the same sort of thing, like, you know, give your minions Death Rattle, draw a card. And that was insane in various token druid builds and I think expansions, honestly, I think it lasted for a while. This is that same sort of vibe, but it is definitely more specific because it is uh, specific to Murloc. So really uh, limiting the the field of play because you just got to have Murlocs, right? And do we have any good token Murloc decks right now? No. Are we going to have any good token Murlocs in space? Obviously, there can be some, but I don't suspect we're going to get a lot of token Murloc decks right now. So this is one of those cards with a really high upside and potential, like, this is a very powerful effect and you never want to write these off because two or three expansions down the line, we might get some Murlocs and a Murloc token shaman or druid or whatever could be a thing. And suddenly brain gill is like, oh my God, this has just been sitting there for two years or well, maybe not two years because it'll rotate, but it's been sitting there for a year and we forgot about it and it's now insane. So this card's going to get a good score just on that potential though. I think it's going to realize that potential anytime soon. No, I don't think it's going to get played at all right now. The score is going to look like a crazy person's score, but, you know, you got to recognize that power is power, and someday that power could be realized. So next up is the Space Pirate, a nice little one mana 2-1 Pirate. With Death Rattle, your next weapon costs one less. And, yeah, I think this is absolutely fine. Some decks have weapons they want to get down quick because they have some kind of effect or Death Rattle or whatever they're trying to achieve as soon as possible, and occasionally you're going to hit this on one it's going to be a decent little body to get things going. Maybe it's a nice aggressive body. If you got some pirates, energies, and weapons you're trying to push face, and it just gets the gears moving, helps you cheat a little mana. It's nothing crazy, but a solid building block. I think this looks just absolutely good. Moving on to the Escape Pod, a three mana 2 1 with Rush and Death Rattle give adjacent minions plus one, plus one, and Rush. So, I mean, sort of a neat idea for some wide board token style decks, you know. Uh, you, you play this down with a couple other things, or maybe you have something on board that trades in and leaves some tokens behind. You know, we've seen plenty of that in, in Death Knight with Reborn cards or whatever. Then you play the Escape Pod in between them and you trade it in and suddenly those get a nice little buff and rush. If you look, it's a lot of total stats in this and rush, but ultimately I do think this is a pretty clunky situational card in many scenarios because it's like, oh, well, I don't have any tokens on board. It's turn three. I have an escape pod in hand. This sucks. <laughs> and you're just not going to have a, a moment where it feels good. So in a weird way, it's kind of a win more card. Like you need to be in a good spot for this to be good, but it's a bad win more card because it doesn't really do enough, I don't think. And uh, in particular, like, you know, often when you have bodies left behind, the rush aspect on this buff is not going to really go that far. They're already able to attack. So it's more about when you're making a bunch of stuff at once, like trading in, uh, to summon those reborns or play things alongside it. And I don't know, man, I don't really see it. Like you, there's some world where, you know, even like we talked about with big stuff like Velen, like I want to kill off my Velen. I could actually play this next to Velen for 10 mana and give Velen rush and trade him in. And it's like, yeah, sure. There are other examples with death rattles you can think of, but man, that is a heavy price to pay to like kill off a big thing. That's not a great way to do that. So I don't really think this is good in small token decks. I think it's just going to be too clunky too often. Sure, there are moments it's fine, but others where it sucks, it's dead. Doesn't make sense to me as an enabler for bigger stuff. So ultimately, I don't think Escape Pod looks particularly good. So moving on to the Light Fused Mana Saber. This is a six mana, six, six rush with Spell Burst, Gain, Divine Shield. So um, honestly, compared to like six mana plays that happened in Hearthstone today, this is just not very good. Like, even, even if you get the Divine Shield, like, what are you going to do to your opponent's Razzle Dazzler board when you're just playing a 6-6? That doesn't even account for the fact that you have to get the Spell Burst down. Sometimes that's going to take extra mana. It's going to be happening after turn 6. This is even a slower card in uh, in many scenarios. So, ultimately, I just this does not have the speed necessary to keep up with Modern Hearthstone. Maybe a fine Arena card, although I kind of worry about the Spell Burst a little bit in that scenario, too. I don't play enough Arena to say. Uh, but just not a constructed card. Like, people are doing busted things by turn six. And, uh, yeah, that's the cards. So now let's give these each a rating from one to five stars. The Exodar is a five-star card. 
Star Volpira is a four star card for a very short while. Red Giant is a two star card. Ace Wayfinder is a one star card. Doom Maiden is a one star card. Mutating Life Form is a three star card. Splitting Space Rock is a two star card. Perplexing Anomaly is a two star card. Stranded Spaceman is a three star card. Moonstone Mauler is a three star card. Troubled Mechanic is a three star card. Brain Gill is a four star card. Space Pirate is a four star card. Escape Pod is a two star card. Light Fused Mana Saber is a one star card. And there you go. That's part two of our Dark Beyond review. Do keep in mind these neutrals, frankly, just tend to be weaker. We just don't play a lot of neutrals, a lot of filler neutrals always. So don't be sad to hear some like one star, two star reviews in here. Uh, the fact that we got a couple threes and fours is actually a pretty good sign for a neutral set. And I think Exodar is actually going to be just like marquee, super strong legendary. We see a lot, especially early on in this expansion. So uh, still some pretty cool stuff to be excited about. That said, curious to hear your thoughts on these cards down in the comments below. Thanks so much as always for watching. And until next time, game on.